Hi everyone, welcome back to the last video of this week lecture. In this video, we will discuss on the mineralocorticoids and adrenocortical antagonists. Let's recap back what you have learned in the previous video. The adenocorticosteroids uh, can be classified into glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids. And another one is gonadocorticoids. And this week lecture, we will focus on the glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids, where the functions differ due to the site of the uh, location being synthesis. The most common glucocorticoids that produce naturally in our body is cortisol that can be produced about 10 mg to 30 mg in the non-stress environments. And the most common mineral corticoids that can be produced naturally in our body is the aldosterone, about 0.1 to 5 mg. Both glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids can be act on both receptors, namely as mineral cortical receptors that functions in for sodium and water retention, and the glucocorticoid receptors, which once it's activated, it has the immunosuppressive effect as well as the anti-inflammatory effects. This uh, in the exogenous form or in the drugs form, it can be found in the in, in the inhaler form in the eye preparations, in the tablet form, and also in the viral formulations to use as intravenous and intraarticular routes. And this is the drugs that are most commonly used in the hospitals. Okay. The most important mineral corticoids in humans is aldosterone. However, small amount of deoxycorticosterone, or known as D, O, C, also can be formed and released. And the fludrocortisone is the only synthetic corticosteroid that is available to prescribe a salt retaining hormone. Aldosterone and other steroids with mineralocorticoid properties promote the reabsorption of sodium from the distal part and distal convoluted renal tubules. These mineral corticoids act on kidney tubules and collecting ducts. It causes a reabsorption of sodium, bicarbonate, and water. Conversely, aldosterone decrease decreases the reabsorption of potassium and iron hydrogen, then lost in the urine. The major effect of activation of the aldosterone receptors is increased expression of sodium potassium ATPase and the epithelial sodium channel ENAC. Enhancement of sodium reabsorption by aldosterone also can occur in the GI mucosa and also in the sweat and salivary glands. In the sweat and salivary gland. These conditions will lead to increase in blood volume and blood pressure. It also may cause alkalosis and hypokalemia. The hyperaldosteronism can be treated with spironolactone that we will be discussed later. Spironolactone, aplerinone, and drospirinone are the steroids that compete with aldosterone for its receptors. Let's look at the spironolactone first. The onset of action is so slow and the effect can last for 2 to 3 days after the discontinuation of the drugs. Clinically, it been used as a primary aldosteronism. Primary aldosteronism, or known as hyperaldosteronism, is a condition that occurs when the adrenal gland produces too much of the aldosterone. 50 to 100 mg per day of spironolactone were used to reverse many of the manifestations of aldosteronism. 400 to 500 mg per day for 4 to 8 days were used to diagnostically detect this aldosteronism in hypokalemic patients with hypertension. Potassium and sodium intake of this patient should be monitored regularly to restore the potassium level towards normal level. 300 to 400 mg per day for 2 weeks were used for preparing this patient for surgery to reduce the incidence of cardiac arrhythmia. And 50 to 200 mg per day 
can be used in the treatment of hirsutism and acne, especially in the woman. It is because spironolactone is also an androgen antagonist. However, it takes about 2 months to see the impact and become maximal in about 6 months. Later, you will be learn in PSC 615 that spironolactone also can be used as diuretic, which benefiting in the heart failure patients. This adverse effect reported for spironolactone include the hyperkalemia, cardiac arrhythmia, menstrual abnormalities, gynecomastia, sedation, headache, gastrointestinal disturbance, and skin rashes. Let's move on to the epilenon. So this epilenon is another aldosterone antagonist that been approved for the treatment of hypertension and heart failure. Epilenon is more selective than spironolactone and no reported effect on the adrenergen receptors. Another one is drospirenon. This drospirenon is normally and commonly used as an oral contraceptive, which means it can act as androgen antagonist. This drospirenone also able to antagonize the effects of aldosterone. Let's move to the glucocorticoid antagonist or known as steroidogenic inhibitors. These steroidogenic inhibitors can be used in the treatment of adrenocortical carcinoma and Cushing syndromes. Some of the glucocorticoid antagonists, which is the mitotan, has the cytostatic antineoplastic medications that we will discuss later. Aminoglutatamide blocks the conversions of cholesterol to prednisolone. Thus, it can prevent the synthesis of all hormonally active steroids such as aldosterone, cortisol, estrogen, as well as the testosterone. It had been used in conjunction with desametasone or hydrocortisone to reduce or eliminate estrogen production, especially in the patient with carcinoma of the breast. Aminoglutatamide can be used in conjunction with metairapone or ketoconazole to reduce thyroid secretion in patients with Cauchy syndrome due to the adrenocortical cancer who do not respond to the metotene. And metotene, a drug related to the DDT class of insecticide, has a cytotoxic action on the adrenal cortex that show a reduction in tumor mass of adrenal carcinoma patients. It acts as an inhibitor of cholesterol side chain cleavage enzyme 20-22 dismolase and also of the 11 beta hydroxylase, 18 hydroxylase, and 3 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. Most of the patients, about 80%, has the toxic effect, which is sufficiently severe to require dose reduction. This includes to those who has the diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, depression, somnolence, and skin rashes. That's why this drug has been withdrawn in the US market. Ketoconazole, an antifungal imidazole derivative, is a potent and rather non selective inhibitor of adrenal and gonadal steroid synthesis. This compound inhibits the cholesterol side chain cleavage, which is the 17 alpha hydroxylase and cytochrome P450 C11 enzyme that required for steroid hormone synthesis. Ketoconazole has been used in the treatment of patients with Cushing syndrome due to several causes. Dosage of 200 to 1200 mg per day have caused a reduction in hormone levels and clinical improvement in some patients. However, this drug has some hepatotoxicity and that's why it should be started at 200 mg per day and slowly increased by 200 mg per day every 2 to 3 days up to a total daily dose of 1000 mg. I believe that everyone have heard etomidate. Hmm. Etomidate is being used for induction of general anesthesia and sedation. 
However, at the subhypnotic dose of 0.1 mg per kilogram per hour, this drug will inhibit the adrenal steroidogenesis at the level of 11 beta hydroxylase. And it also has been used as oral, the only parental medication that available in the treatment of severe Cushing syndrome. That's all for this week lecture. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask me. And take care everyone. Bye.